Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com, a Paramount podcast. I am Mike Casaz live after midnight here on early Sunday morning at Mountaineer Field, site of West Virginia's choose your own adjective 17 to 6 win against Pitt. Chris Anderson, I say choose your own adjective because uh, this is kind of an ink blot too. I think we said this last week, but this is going to mean more to some people than others, less to some people than others. Beauty is certainly in the eye of the beholder. Here's a team that needed to win and beat Pitt. Got it. Style points, elusive. Maybe not something the Mountaineers should be interested in as much as, you know, the number in the left column. But here we are again, trying to figure out what to take out of a game that from the very beginning kept us on our toes uh, to the very end. And let me start by going back just like you know, to our last conversation, maybe to last year. We compared Penn State game to last year's Pitt game, where mm-hmm. it was like, hey, West Virginia was competitive and lost to what it was expected to be a good team. Now, Penn State is expected to be a much better team than Penn, um, Pitt was last year. And then, you know, week two, uh, yeah, you blow out a, an overmatched FCS team. And then week three, is this, it, you know, what do you take of this game? And should we be comparing it to, uh, well, I'm going back week four, not week three. Because mm-hmm. obviously Kansas was mixed in there with the early Big 12 game. But does this, does this give you an inkling of like the Virginia Tech game where it was like, hey, you beat Virginia Tech, feels great. What well, holy, because I remember our conversation after that game you and I talking after the Virginia Tech game and both going, everyone hold your horses because holy crap, Virginia Tech is bad. Are we there with Pitt? And are we doing the hold your horses thing with West Virginia again right now? I was thinking about that. Like all the rivals that West Virginia has played lately haven't been good. Like Penn State notwithstanding, I'm not sure. I mean, that's that's been a rival back in the the old days, I guess. But I guess so was Pitt and Maryland, Virginia Tech. It seems like every time you get the old gang back together, it's not. It's like they forgot football evolved <laughs> since the heyday of the rivalry, and it's kind of been kind of a a mismatch of um of just different styles and uh, shades of <laughs> um. Th- this was a weird one, man, and like. I'm I'm sure that Brown wanted to be more emphatic, but I think above all else, he did not want to be on the losing side, and he, he walks out tonight again a 17 to six winner. And if you're of the uh, a win is a win is a win crowd, um, man, Chris, I'm gonna have to go back and try to find this. I can't find it t- the last time they won with fewer than 17 points. Um, I'm pretty sure it was 2008. Um, Bill Stewart's first year, and they play uh who was at usf at the end of the season i think that was a 13 to 7 game uh the last time they scored 17 or fewer in one 2016 um a win against tcu um, just doesn't happen very often the offensive evolution in the sports points per game is really important and to score 17 is not unlike brown Neil Brown in his five seasons. This is now the, again, the 21st time with 20 or fewer points against a power five opponent in 44 games. That's an interesting split. Just the second time he's won though. And I think when you consider that he really did have to have this and to lose your quarterback on the fifth play and go to plan B, which is, I mean, it's so far from plan A, according to Brown after the game, just to get the win and to actually have some style points from your defense that, that helps even it up a little bit, I think. You're right in that USF game, 2008, uh, regular season. Top of my head, baby. Yep. You know what else came in that same season? And, is, and it's why I think so many fans were frustrated with the uh, the offense that year. That was a brutal pit game that year too, right? Uh, pit game was bad. Was it pit? Yeah, 1915. Ooh. But also Syracuse, 17-6. WVU win, and they threw for 52 yards. That's the last time for 60 or fewer yards, which is what they threw for tonight. The last time they passed for 60 or fewer. And they won, yeah. right? Yeah, and they won. I'll give you a better one. Uh huh. The last time that they had 211 or fewer yards in one, I wasn't even alive. 
that goes back to like 1980. I was born in 1980, so like it was before the 1980 season. It's at least 25 games. The the record keeping I have access to does not go that far back. Um, oh my god! <laughs> so it's been at least 43 years since they had this many yards. This this few, this low a yardage total. How's that? And actually won the game. And to do it against a rival again in a team that is is. You know, back into a corner for so many reasons, and then gets backed up a little bit further when the quarterback goes out. Again, just the fact that you won is, is it does kind of matter here because man, you watch Pitt smash his weight on the field in that first drive, and then all of a sudden Green's out, and you're just thinking this is not going to end well. If you're one of the people who's in a gold or blue shirt, I guess from West Virginia on the striped stadium, and then to see it turn around and and the defense to again relative competition but for, for the defense to play pretty well i would say that that makes up some of the style points that you lacked with a lackluster offense yeah i don't want people to listen to this and and hear me compare this to virginia tech last year where we were like hey everybody hold your horses like this win doesn't mean much i mean i i do think this pit team is bad i do think yeah uh their quarterback like if they put him back out there again like and you're a pit fan, you just walk out of the stadium. I think I think you're just done. Um, he's he's not. He's probably the worst Power Five quarterback I've seen WVU go against. Is that too like too extreme? Uh, since you got the off the top of the head thing going right now, it, who who's worse than what you just saw tonight? I mean, Kansas has he's played. Kansas had some duds before. Guys that just shouldn't have been playing power five football but i mean for a guy who's decorated and is a veteran and has experience that was kind of startling how how bad he looked and some of the mistakes he made i didn't see the third interception i was on the way down to the the field but the first two were, were seemed like i don't want to say carbon copies are pretty similar and were just terrible plays and i don't know what he's doing but it's a guy that looks like he does not like pressure and does not trust his surroundings right now and west virginia to its credit turned up the heat uh realized that it could do some things and it just kind of kept cracking the the protection and getting through um, that was no, pretty good to see if you're a West Virginia proponent of the defense and you're trying to find something good there. That was um that was probably redeeming in some sense. But man, you're right, top of the head. What would be worse than those guys? I don't know. I'm trying to think of like some of the guys that man, like what was his name Peyton Bender maybe from Kansas. Um, and they had some bad ones. Carter Stanley was the guy. I was like, is this guy really a player? They had like Montel Cozart. I think I remember seeing him interning at a basketball tournament once. Because he wasn't playing football anymore. The next thing you know, he's out there playing football against West Virginia. Uh, I don't know why I'm stuck in Kansas right now, but yeah, for for a guy who's that experience, has that type of um, you know pedigree from high school, and even you know he went to Notre Dame and then Boston College, and he's played for some good teams and coaches. And you figured that he'd be more advanced than what you saw there tonight. And just just I don't know, is he the best quarterback, college quarterback in Pittsburgh? <laughs> like, would you have traded Darius Parentes for him? Probably. Well, yeah. Let's put it. I, I don't want to. I don't want to go too hard. I mean, this this is not. A, I mean, there, I think there are some good players on this pit team, but with the quarterback being as bad as they were, they just really had no chance. And I think West Virginia played really well. I think that's what that was the point I was trying to get to here was this team, this pit team, might be as bad as that Virginia Tech team last year, but I saw more good stuff from WVU in this win than maybe I saw from W and that win over Virginia Tech last year, if that makes sense. Like yeah, it, it, just, you, it feels different. When you're getting blitz and rushed like that, too, you're going to look bad, especially if you don't like your receivers and your protection. But West Virginia sensed that and went after it. And like when they when they decided they were going to go pedal to the metal on defense and really kind of pressure, the game changed. They were just they were much more, I don't know, rapid, physical, whatever the point of attack. And I mean, that was that was significant, too, because if they were going to stand back and get, get teed off in the running game, um, they probably were going to have a longer night, but that first drive, Chris, 67 yards rushing. The rest of the game, 63 yards rushing. They stopped the nonsense in the running game right away and then pretty much said, like, there's no way number five is going to be this defense, which is a weird thing to say if you've heard us talk about the defense, but just did enough, like, covered receivers. You didn't have any, like, jail breaks where it looked bad. There was one or two moments where, like, oh, that doesn't look good, but they they really made it difficult on him. The West Virginia's defensive line continues to impress, whether that's against the run or the pressure. Um, on the defense, yeah, I know you singled out for Torma Moba um, for some of the things he did up front, but like Tomiwa Durajayi got after the quarterback. Sean Martin was aggressive coming around the corner. Um, 
small sample, but Tyron Bradley as a bandit was probably maybe the more effective of the bandits today. Like they had some things that they were able to cook up and do. Um, and yeah, this quarterback who does have pedigree, who is experienced, who has played at Notre Dame and Boston college and been on good teams and had good coaches. He looked poor for a reason. And somewhere, a lot of that is West Virginia. So you're right. Credit them. Do not want to take it away saying like, Hey, this team only won or only looked good because the opponent was bad. There's a sliding scale there too. And sometimes you, you look bad and play poorly because the other team is that good and had that, I don't know that good of a plan or execution, but I, I think you have to really give West Virginia some some credit to that and acknowledge that they made some improvements. And, and this will go to what you you kind of hinted at, Chris, that they were up to something that they did not show against Duquesne. Neil Brown mentioned it during the week. And then after the game tonight, said that they they saw some flaws after the Penn State game, worked on it in practice, didn't show it against Duquesne. And I don't know if it was personnel or tactics tonight, but um, I know they had everything fit up and they, they got up blocks and they didn't get – outnumbered or swallowed in certain points and and the pass defense was just much better yeah pass defense was much better the pressure was much better i like the you mentioned bradley i thought he got eaten up on that first drive and run and mm-hmm. run defense um from that bandit spot but then he did much better late when it was just pure hey get out for the quarterback <laughs> especially when as i'm typing up on the stock up stock down about now i'm just so far out on the bandit position, it's driving me nuts. And then they go double bandit, two bandits, three down linemen, two bandits at the same time for that last drive. I think you, you might, again, you were uh, walking down for to the field and going to post game, but they showed it on replay. And I think it, it was on the play that uh, Bradley got the sack. I believe that also on the play where he threw that third interception, it was three down linemen with Bartlett on one side and Bradley on the other and brought both bandits off the edge, almost like a pincer move. And it looked good, Mike. Looked good. I kind of like it. Maybe that's what they had in the uh, the drawing board that they did not uncover here, too. Um, let's talk offense for West Virginia. Um, I'm going to assume that Garrett Green will – I'm going to assume, but, like, we don't have any confirmation. But that looks like maybe high ankle sprain, but certainly an ankle sprain, um, I'm guessing. Maybe it's something worse, but you're in a walking boot. Um, they're probably not letting you walk around in a broken foot, you know, so I'm not going to say it's a Liz Frank or a fracture of the foot or whatever. So let's just say ankle sprain, high ankle sprain, but something with the lower extremity on the right side, uh, unlikely to play. So now, how do you go against Texas Tech, which is going to come in with a backup quarterback of its own, but probably have to match points. It'll have to be a lot better tonight, but... Um, do you do you take anything from next week that would make you feel poorly about West Virginia's chances based on what you saw tonight? Or is this one of those things where Mark Gill gets, you know, a quarter of the snaps in practice and you have to adjust on the fly and you really can't project for because this is such a unique situation for him? I think it's a unique uh, situation, and I think he was rattled at first and kind of straightened up a little bit. I mean, he was not asked to do too much. But I thought it was notable that he began the game 0 for 3, passing the ball. Mm -hmm. And a couple of those passes were not particularly close or good or smart. And then went 6 of 6 after that for 13, 15, touchdown, 10, then 1 on a little dinker, and then 14. So he went 6 for 6 down the stretch with four of those six passes going for a first down or a touchdown and a fifth pass going for 13 yards, but it was second and 17. Mm -hmm. So he showed he was at least capable um, with some of those throws. And I made note of a couple plays when I was doing my plays that changed the game. When he kept it, I think it was third and six, I think is what it was. And he kept it and went, he didn't slide. He went head first in, ready to knock somebody down as they tried to tackle him and got that first down. And that boosted WVU's chances of winning, according to ESPN's probability index, from 85% to 92.6%. Hmm. And so it's just those kind of plays there that like you're making and you just don't think much of. But had a nice run there. Again, went 6-6, six and six, and I think that's happened. But take that and then add on to it. And you, you I mean, you're going to know this better than me because you're in the room, but was I reading that correctly? That that Neil Brown basically said he threw away the entire playbook, more or less. Yeah, uh, because it was like we're just going on the fly now. I mean, the playbook in the first half was like split zone left, split zone right. 
because they were, I think they were just trying to shelter in place and try to get to halftime maybe or figure things out as they could. And like, okay, let's, can he buy me five minutes of turnover free football here? Maybe we can get the first downs. And like, you just try to, I mean, it's pouring and you're trying to find a dry place. So you're going to write some notes down, right? That's kind of what you're thinking because the sky is falling on you a little bit. And I think they were just trying to buy some time and they did. But Brown said they scrapped the game plan and then like he grabbed a notebook or a notepad and was jotting things down that he remembered from practice so that he could talk to Nico about like, what do you like? What can we do? You talk to your your run game coach and your pass game coach on the ground in the sky and say, what do we see? What can work? And then they they start to plug things in a little bit. It just It's just so hard because he hasn't done a lot. I mean, again, maybe maybe 25 percent of the snap. So it's a lot of it's on the fly, which, again, you have to give the staff co- credit here because if you don't like their game plans or you think that they call poor call bad plays and just it doesn't look good take away the keystone and then try to figure out how to hold it together. And they didn't collapse. Like you would expect they would. It didn't look pretty. Don't get me wrong. But like, there were a couple moments that you mentioned there. I thought after the, the Burks interception to go right to a play that they knew was going to be good for Marchio kind of caught them off guard. I think everybody's thinking, okay, they're right down the goal line. They're probably going to hand it to number four. Didn't kind of worked with Taylor and got him outside and easy touchdown. Um, There was a play later in the game too, where, They motioned Fox from the slot on the left outside on the right. And that got Devin Carter um, lined up against a safety because it made made Carter the slot receiver. And that turned into like a a, like a post, maybe it was an RPO, but like it just stuck it right in Carter's number for a first down play. And then yeah, you mentioned the run for the first down. That was cool. And that was his read and go. So the, the team didn't say, hey, absolutely hand it off or hey, absolutely don't run it. It was up to him which is kind of an interesting luxury they gave him, but they were feeling like, all right, he's a little bit more comfortable. And you know what? We're going to have to see what he can do sooner or later, because I think there was a sample size in that second half where they were like, listen, this might be our quarterback for next week or the next couple of weeks. We got to get some stuff out there and see what he can do. And that might've been one of those moments, but I also thought that, and it didn't, it didn't turn into anything, but there was like a third and seven play where they sent um, Rodney Gallagher, who is on the team, sent him in motion and they threw it out to him in the flat. And it was like a third down play in West Virginia territory. And you don't want him to screw that up and make a mistake, but they let him do it. And they punted, which is fine. A punt was a good play tonight sometimes. But it was curious, man. They 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 kind of loosened up a little bit and became more aggressive. Small, small bites. Don't get me wrong. But they were they were seeing things a little bit better with him. They felt more comfortable with him. And they're gonna have to really loosen up and really give him more control. If they're gonna play with him for one game, two game, three games, who knows? Lost my mute button there. Sorry. Um, what did you think of the offensive line today? Hit and miss. Got a lot of help from the tight ends. Like the second half, yeah. especially, they were playing, you know, they threw some Nick Malone in there, a lot of Traylon Davis and Cole Taylor together, um, and, and almost like pulling the offensive linemen as tight ends, though. Like they were having two tight ends on one side, and all of a sudden they would sweep Davis and Taylor across. But the offensive line was going the other way, too. So it was, it was kind of some sleight of hand, but it really worked out well. But when when they needed to, they moved forward a bunch and I mean, save one or two moments, good pass protection and um, pretty, pretty physical. There was there were some there were some clashes up front. Like I, I noted this in, um, in the game thread and everything. But like on that drive where Donaldson just hammered at them on the goal line on two plays in a row, like the offensive line was just like. Cracking people for a couple of plays before that, and you can kind of feel like they were in their comfort zone. They were playing pretty good. They. You mentioned this too, like the the guard center guard against Cincinnati was really good for the Bearcats, um, not for Pitt. And West Virginia was able to kind of go up the middle of a bunch today and, and I think 18 carries for Donaldson and Anderson. And a lot of it was inside too. I have to see the PFF stuff, but I felt like they could get outside every now and then, but when they wanted to make hay, they kind of went inside. So a good sign for, for a group that's supposed to play well in games like this. When, listen, when, when you have one hand tied behind your back as your quarterback goes out, you lean in your offensive line. And they were able to do that today because that group is supposed to be that type of group. Glad you brought up the tight end thing because it leads me to a bigger point that I wanted to make because something that I had not seen from Neil Brown or the staff much over the previous years and, and something that Lord knows I've mentioned on this podcast was not seeing something new or different or trying something, um, you, you know, if something didn't work, just moving to something completely different. And it, and it was, it was frustrating and it, you didn't understand why it wasn't happening. And tonight on both sides of the ball, it was, I mean, some of it by necessity, obviously because of injury to Garrett green, but they obviously implemented some of that like double tight end, almost like, you know, lead blocking sweeps 
with those guys. Um, and, and that's just not something we've seen much from West Virginia doing. And and the coaching staff put it in there, and it worked. And I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. I mean, the players deserve credit for for making it work. Because God, Traylon, there was one where Traylon Davis went, you know, from right side of the line to the left, and he crunched that end on that side like immediately. I mean, it sounded like a freight train. And, and and they were clearing space every time that they were sweeping out wide. And I thought that was a really nice job by them, but also a very nice job by the staff and like and changing things there and, and and making it work. Speaking of changing, we mentioned some of the defensive adjustments that were unveiled that maybe even we don't even know about that could be like imperceptible kind of a, of a uh, cause effect there. But some personnel stuff, Hudson Clement starts, they put Devin Carter on the other side. They get Horton in. I think he... I think he played a handful of snaps and they targeted him once and it was a miss. Um, little Gallagher, little bit of Jaheim White, no Justin Johnson. I'm trying to think here. And then on defense, some Marcus Floyd, Marcus Floyd, even though Anthony Wilson started. And I wonder about that because, correct me if I'm wrong, they did say that Floyd was going to start on the radio, correct? That is what Neil Brown said. Okay. I think what might have happened was that Keyshawn Cobb got hurt and then all of a sudden you have to have that versatile part that can play like nickel and safety. I'm not sure Wilson can do that, and Floyd can. And Floyd was playing like a little bit of nickel and then some backup safety. So I wonder if that wasn't just like if something happened after that, maybe like Cobb wasn't able to go. And then rather than rather than just kind of go depth chart change because, all right, this guy's out, put this guy in. I think they want the best possible plan, which is start Wilson and then play Floyd in that versatile. Like he can do a couple of things spot, see what happens when they get him back. But um, And then Ruffin, again, was, was good at corner and – the corners did not have to be great tonight, but interception by Beanie Bishop, interception by, uh, I mentioned Burks, interception by Malachi Ruffin. That's three picks against a team that spent the week under siege and it is going to be, for a different reason, will be under siege again next week. Uh, how much better do you feel about them? Or do you just, again, do you grade in the curve? Because that pit passing game is so elementary, so unimpressive. I mean, you can only take so much from it, but it's much like when I was talking about what I wanted to see from Garrett Green when they took on Duquesne. I wanted to see him make those plays because it's not against air. It's it's not an FBS team. It's not against air. So it, it's something. It's something that I can see um, that actually means at least a little something. And I feel the same way about this. Like Pitt, Pitt's passing game is... I think that was a very polite way of putting it as elementary, <laughs> Michael. Thank you. It's very polite. Mm. Um, so, I mean, that that Beanie Bishop interception, first off, all the credit in the world to him for the 40-yard return. That was awesome. That was big. But he, I, I mean, go back and watch the replay. He's literally standing there like he's fielding a punt and is waiting for like five seconds for the ball to get to him. It's directly to his chest. He's just standing there. So it is what it is. The Malachi Ruffin one, that was an amazing play. That was, you know, athletically and physically just a, a remarkable play by him. Um, mm. Burks was, was 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 something else too. And again, another nice return. That's that's two things, that's two big returns that I don't really recall uh WVU DBs doing when they did get interceptions in recent years. So that that, that was helping out an offense that was struggling a bit, but Take it's it for what point. it's worth. It's a great yeah. point. They needed they needed the yardage for sure, and they get like going to get inside the five on one, and then inside scoring distance another. That's ten points, and they won by eleven, so that's good. They took points potentially away. That's fine. Um, again, four for thirteen on third down, zero for two on fourth down. They stopped the quarterback sneak. Uh, pit nine penalties for sixty five yards, and and, and he, just to again to underscore how how good the defense was. Both teams finished with two hundred eleven yards, two eleven, not great, but. West Virginia's longest play, Chris, was 17 yards on 62 snaps. That's not going to work. And it didn't have to work tonight. Again, you could you could really dial it back. And I wonder if they got a sense or they got a beat on Pitt or their defense and said, you know what, we can win this game. I'm not trying to be funny. Or we can win this game in the 20s. And they did because we were talking, I think all things equal, they're probably going to have to get to in the 30s. But everything changes and all your planning is out the window. When your quarterback goes out, you got to go with the guy who hasn't played a whole lot. So, I, I again, the defense had to be good today, and it was. Um, it helped that Pitt 
really complied with the uh, offensive inefficiencies there now too. Anything else stand out to you here before we wrap up? No, uh, atmosphere, great. Uh, glowing reviews from recruits. I will be posting those probably in the morning. Um, again, as we're re- recording this, it's after midnight, strongly after midnight, and I'm still getting messages from recruits that are trying to make their way home. They were literally stuck around until the very end for many of them. Uh, some of them texting me saying they couldn't answer quite yet because they were in the locker room enjoying the celebration. So um, sounds like they had a good time. And we'll have those updates up on Sunday with with the rest of the usual stuff, including a very interesting plays that change the game because it's it's – Sometimes I just can't do those because it's always 80% for one team or another. This one obviously flip-flopped with, with it going back and forth, hovering around 50%, jumping all over the place with a few big plays. And so that'll be a good read in the morning too. Final score from Mountaineer Field, 17 to 6, 61,106 fans. See, the Mountaineers approved to 2 and 1. Pitt falls to one and two. They will be back again next year in Pittsburgh, year after in Morgantown. That goes on break for three years, and then it's back for four more years. Hopefully, quarterback play is improved, and quarterbacks are healthier the next time we do this. In the morning, three things I think, three things I know. We'll get you some notes and quotes from the post game. Snap counts, which ought to be interesting given some of the developments before and during the game. And then you mentioned a little bit, Chris, you'll have plays that change the game. You'll have your power rankings. I'm assuming you'll have some updates from recruits once they can actually clear some time in their schedule for you. And then we're back in a game week where, again, the whip last year is significant because, hey, congratulations to Brian, you beat Pitt. Guess what? Here comes Texas Tech, the team you haven't beat. Um, this ought to be a fun week, huh? It's going to be a busy one. I know that. Rather have it no other way. Hey, uh, watch your feet. Protect your ankles. Make sure you're healthy on Monday. Until next time, I'm Mike Casazza. And I'm Chris Anderson. We will talk to you then.